starts Tuesday at 8 on BBC Two. Hello and welcome to Thursday Morning on BBC Two. Wanted Down Under in half an hour after a good read with Anne Robinson. in books a chance for our guests to share some of their favourite reads. With me tonight, Baroness James of Holland Park, better known to her fans as the famous crime writer P.D. James. The Baroness is in her 91st year. Alongside her, the radio and TV presenter Richard Bacon. He made a bit of a name for himself for being on, then off Blue Peter. He now modestly describes himself as a minor celebrity and presenter on Radio 5 Live. So, a gap of 55 years between my guests. Thank you both for joining me. <laughs> Phyllis, tell us a bit about what it was like when you were growing up. Well, uh, we lived at Ludlow, a very, very beautiful town. My father worked in income tax, and I have a, a sister who's 18 months younger than I am, and then a brother, there are three of us. And we were educated in the state system. Was it a house full of books? No. No, it never really? was. It never was. So, really, all my reading life, at least until I became an adult and had money to buy books, I used to get them from the public library. Richard, many years later, your childhood was in Mansfield in Nottingham. Yes. Your father was a lawyer. Still and is. your mother was a teacher. Were you reading from an early age? Yeah, I, I was. There, there, there were plenty of books in the house. It wasn't full of books, but um, I'm from what I suppose you would call a firmly middle-class household. Uh, and we had books. We're going to begin with childhood reads. Phyllis, your first choice is Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice. Yes. How old were you when you read this? Well, remarkably young. Um, it's quite astonishing, really, because I don't think it's a book for the very young. Can you give us a quick summary of the plot? It's a romantic novel, um, <laughs> and it is about um, a family of girls, five of them, um, and they have a, a rather poor outlook because when their father dies, the dreadful Mr Collins will take over the whole of the state. So it's very important that they find husbands, especially in those days. And the heroine is the second daughter, Elizabeth. And, of course, Mrs Bennet's Mrs. sole Bennett desire is, in life. She is <laughs> desperate to get her daughters married. You say mm. that, for you, it's one of the great pieces of English literature. Oh, it is. It's the most sparkling. And it's, it's the, the one you lyrical. discovered first today. Oh, Aiden. yes, and you'll get straight into the story, Anne, which yeah. is a thing for an eight-year-old, which I was at the time. You're going to read us a little bit. Yes, indeed. I think it's from <coughs> my own book, isn't it, yeah. Mrs Bennet rang the bell and Miss Elizabeth was summoned to the library. Come here, child, cried her father as she appeared. I have sent for you on an affair of importance. I understand that Mr Collins has made you an offer of marriage. Is this true? Elizabeth replied that it was. Very well. And this offer of marriage you have refused. I have, sir. Very well. We now come to the point. Your mother insists upon your accepting it. Is not it so, Mrs Bennet? Yes, or I will never see her again. An unhappy alternative is before you, Elizabeth. From this day, you must be a stranger to one of your parents. Your mother will never see you again if you do not marry Mr Collins, and I will never see you again if you do. <laughs> Richard, have you read Pride and Prejudice? I, have. I enjoyed Phyllis reading it out. Yeah. That was, could we just go, could you just go through the whole book? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, um, when did you read it? Well, I uh, read it at school, and I have not reread it. As an adult, you obviously have reread it. Yeah. Yeah. Is it just as good as it is? It just as effective rereading oh, it? Just as right. Do reread it. Do reread it. Then yes, I it's, shall. it's great fun rereading it. Yeah. Yeah. Richard, what's your first book? The, the book that I want to talk about first is uh, Roald Dahl's Boy. Roald Dahl was my, my first favourite author. This is autobiographical. He wrote this in 1984. And it is, it's written for children, and it's about him. It's from birth to when he gets his first job, but most of it is set at school. And he went to uh, a prep school called Repton, and I went to a prep school called Wellow in Nottinghamshire, and Repton is in Derbyshire. 
And so uh, and we played Repton at sport. And so when I read the book, I could visualise a lot of the places uh, that he was talking about. Now, there's a particular incident that you like in the book, isn't yes, there? Yes. Can you there tell us a... about it? Yes, I certainly can. As a seven-year-old boy, he has a fixation on a sweet shop near his house. And when I was about that age, um, there was a sweet shop uh, near where I live that I was fascinated with as well. And he just loves confectionery. He's brilliant in describing the detail of the sweets. But he is a seven-year-old boy puts a uh, dead rat in a jar of gobstoppers. Oh, oh <laughs> exactly. It's not a pleasant yeah. idea. Mrs Pratchett runs the shop and he and his friends simply don't like her. So they hatch this plan. Uh, actually, it's a dead mouse, I think, and they put it in the gobstoppers and run out the shop. Uh, and she finds it and she drops the jar and it shatters all over the floor and they get in a lot of trouble at school. They um, would. And, yeah. And this is the little scene where he is being caned by the headmaster. By the time the fourth stroke was delivered, my entire backside seemed to be going up in flames. Far away in the distance, I heard Mr Coombs' voice saying, now get out, Mr Coombs, the headmaster. As I limped across the study, clutching my buttocks hard with both hands, a cackling sound came from the armchair over in the corner. And then I heard the vinegary voice of Mrs Pratchett saying, I am very much obliged to you, headmaster, very much obliged. I don't think we're going to see any more stinking mice in my gobstoppers from now on. <laughs> because in those days, the headmaster would be in, in court in no time. Yeah. But all the teachers were... in his book are cruel, aren't they? I mean, it, it mm. really was him paying back for the time he'd had. There's a bit um, when, he, uh, when he's a bit older, and he's at Repton, that's before Repton, and he is a fag for a prefect, uh, and the prefect would make him warm up his toilet seat every day. So Roald Dahl oh. had this job. <laughs> and he had, he had to sit on a toilet seat and he had to get it to the, exactly the right temperature, <laughs> to within one degree. And according to Roald Dahl, that over the years that he did this, he did this day after day, accumulating hours of sitting on a toilet seat, he claims that in that time, he read the entire works of Charles Dickens. <laughs> <laughs> Phyllis, we're on to your second book which is The Hounds of the Baskervilles by yes. Arthur Conan Doyle. How old are you by now? Oh, I'm adolescent by now. Yeah. And I can't say that I, uh, I liked his short stories, but I did um, very much enjoy The Hounds of the Baskervilles, and it seemed to me brilliantly written, probably one of the greatest crime novels really ever written. Yeah. Um, Tell us a bit of the plot. <laughs> Well, Holmes is called in, as he often is, by somebody who comes to his, his uh, room at 20, 221 Baker Street and says that uh, there is um, a curse on the family of Baskervilles who, who live on Dartmoor and uh, they have died under awful circumstances, killed by a vicious hound from hell, something that isn't natural. And the, the last Baskerville died in that way and now his heir is arriving from overseas to take possession and this is the doctor, and he's very, very worried. He wants to have the, this mystery solved, and he calls in Holmes. You didn't start writing professionally until you were in your 30s, but had you actually decided from a child that you were going to be a writer? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think I was born knowing that I... Not that I wanted to be a writer, I was born knowing that I was a writer. It's just a question of whether I got down and did it. I seem not to have doubted that I could do it, but I did very much doubt whether anybody would want to buy my books. I didn't think I would ever be a best-selling writer. And I had a husband who came back mentally ill from the war, so by then I had to support him and two small girls. So I had to have safe jobs. So really for the whole of my writing, except for the latter years, I have been a bureaucrat, first in the health service and then in the home office. And I've used all that experience in my books. Well, 100 years on, Arthur Conan Doyle's work is still being enjoyed. We've got a clip here from last year's very successful BBC series with Benedict Cumberbatch playing Sherlock Holmes. Shut up. I didn't say anything. You were thinking. It's annoying.
I thought it was absolutely brilliant, that programme. And it's interesting how fascinated people are by home still. Even though it's set now, it's full of the detail of the original books. Phyllis, do you share that opinion? It's a wonderful idea to bring it up to date and yet remain, you know, faithful to the actual character and to his methods. Very faithful. Richard, your next choice uh, came about... You'd gone to university in Nottingham... Yeah. ..and had enough very shortly, hadn't you? You were yeah. 19 when you cleared off. I did. I did. Yeah. I did a year there. Um, I wanted to work in radio and I, I got offered a full-time job as a reporter, so I, I left uni. What were you reading? Uh, it, was, uh, it was... You strange... can't remember, Richard. <laughs> no, <laughs> not really. <laughs> it was a very strange degree that I took at the last minute and it was a hybrid of business studies and electronics. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> together at last. Um, and it was rubbish, and so I uh, went off into radio. Yeah. So, the book is called Stick It Up Your Punter... Indeed. ..by Peter Chippendale and Chris Horry. What's it about? It is about Rupert Murdoch buying The Sun. Yeah. Um, and it then becomes about his first editor called Larry Lamb, not to be confused with the Gavin and Stacey EastEnders actor Larry Lamb, and then... A guy called Kelvin McKenzie takes over editorship of The Sun rather infamously during the 1980s. And most of it really is about Kelvin. Um, it's, it's an outrageous book. It's an exciting book. Uh, it's a funny book and it's a shocking book. Have you met but, him? Yeah, many times. I, yeah. I went on to work for him. Kelvin um, commissioned a documentary, this is a grand word, that I made for him called Behind the Scenes of Topless Darts on Ice. And <laughs> in, in many ways, Phyllis, it's still my best work. <laughs> Did you, do you end up regarding Kelvin McKenzie as a hero or a villain? Um, I suppose both, really. A monster in some ways. A monster in some ways, yeah. yeah. A bit, uh, as an editor, he was brilliant. But at the same time, some of his views and some of the things he did were absolutely... Uh, Outrageous. This will shock you, OK? The paper was arousing strong resentment from the world's worst, which was Kelvin's nickname for The Guardian, and other unpopulars for its AIDS coverage. The disease had come onto the news agenda in a big way for the first time in early 1985, bringing out all Mackenzie's instinctive hatred of pufters in speech marks. A report in the paper in February quoted an anonymous psychologist at an AIDS conference in Washington, D.C., as advocating mass killings of gays. All homosexuals should be exterminated to stop the spread of AIDS. It's time we stopped pussyfooting around, he supposedly said. This reported in The Sun in the 1980s. Mackenzie responded to hacks, expressing mild concern about the paper's approach to the subject, with jeers like, ''Come out, have we, eh? One of them, are we?'' Followed by a shout across the editorial floor, ''Watch out, folks, there's a bossy burglar about.'' You know, that shows you partly his personality, partly how shocking it was, partly how attitudes have, have changed as well. Your admiration of the tabloids is uh, quite surprising it, because you've been a real victim, haven't you? I've been a victim and I, I was a, a story in the news of the world, which you very kindly alluded to at the very start of the programme, Anne, thank you. And, um, I don't know it. I yeah, well, Richard, Phyllis, tell Phyllis like to... what you got up to. Uh, well, I'd like to know. Well... Yes. <laughs> The audience would like to know, wouldn't yeah. Yeah, We all want to know. Well, as, as a reader of Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle, I believe you'll be familiar with the drug cocaine. Oh, yeah, uh, very familiar, yeah. Just to bring it back to literature. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I was a Blue Peter... You know Blue Peter? Mm, yes. And so I was a Blue Peter presenter and I took some cocaine. Yes. And then uh, Best Friend sold my story to the News of the World and then I got sacked and it was all over the News of the World. And what was interesting was I am an admirer of tabloid newspapers. Mm. And I find them fascinating. I don't support everything they do, uh, but I am fascinated by the way they operate. And it gave... And I had this grudging respect for the way they'd reported my own story. So it left me in this emotionally compromised place where I was angry at being turned over mm. and yet somehow slightly admired what they'd done. You've brought uh, along a boy's toy, haven't you? Yes, yes. This is, this is how I often uh, read books now. This is my... My iPad. Do you understand I... why people would like to read books on an electronic device? I try to, but I think it's very much a, a generation thing. Um, for me, uh, anything, any technology will go wrong as almost as soon as I touch it, and I'm sure it would go wrong. I love yeah, books. I just <clears throat> love books. I love the fear of them, the smell of them, taking them down from the... 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, Anne's really an impressive. Well, I like Phyllis. I just love books. Yeah. I mean, I, I heard I you say you give them away. I find it very hard to throw out books. Oh, it's the, the, the nice thing is, look, this is Roald Dahl's boy, and yes. you still get to turn a page. You see that on the camera, but you still flick the page along. It's not the same. It's not as satisfying as holding a book, but no. they do quite a good job of replicating what it's like to read a book. They Phyllis, do. your next book... And by this time, you're working in the National Health Service, aren't Probably, you? Probably, yes. 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 And it's Evelyn Moore's A Handful of Dust. Oh, it certainly would be in the health service, yes. Give us a brief description. This is, a, I think, a major novel, a brilliant novel, by one of the great masters of the English language. <laughs> He's amazing at dialogue. And it's really the story of an unfaithful marriage. Uh, uh, Tony Last, he has a, a big country house. It's a great Victorian, very ugly one, but he loves it. He's been in the family for a long time, and he's married to Brenda, and uh, they've got a little boy, and she's obviously bored, and she takes this dreadful John Beaver as her lover and has a little flat in town and pretends she's taking lessons. In fact, she's sleeping with Beaver. You're talking about his dialogue, and you, you were going to yes. read us a little bit. The mother has nothing to do with the little boy. He's brought up by the nanny and by the groom, Ben, whom he adores. And um, because of Ben teaches them some very odd language, he's called, t tells his nanny she's an old tart. So there's very <laughs> great trouble about that. I should have thought it was very nicely be called a tart, John argued. And anyway, it's a word Ben often uses about people. Well, he's got no business to. I like Ben more than anyone in the world, and I should think he's clever too. Tony felt that the time had come to cut out the cross stalk and deliver the homily he had been preparing. Now listen, John. It was very wrong of you to call Nanny a silly old tart. First, because I was unkind to her. Think of all the things she does for you every day. She's paid to. Be quiet. <laughs> and secondly, because you were using a word which people of your age and class do not use. Poor people use certain expressions which gentlemen do not. You are a gentleman. You, when you grow up, you must be considerate to people less fortunate than you, particularly women. Do you understand? Is Ben less fortunate than me? That has nothing to do with it. Now you are to go upstairs and say you are truly sorry to Nanny and promise never to use that word about anyone again. All right. You know, we, we know about the little boy. We know the relationship of the father with the little boy. We know the values that the father lives by. And um, it is an absolutely brilliant book. Did you meet him ever, Phyllis, Evelyn Moore? I've never met him. I'm rather glad I didn't. I think he could be very unpleasant. Yes, tricky. Very <laughs> unpleasant, very <laughs> tricky. Yes, absolutely. Not perhaps a very nice man, but no. a brilliant writer. And what he did teach me, not only how to do dialogue, and how, but how to care about the writing. He constantly revised his novels. Did you, do you revise with each no. reissue? No. No, I don't, but I tried to get it right first time. <laughs> 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 I don't, I don't, I, if there's a silly error, I might, of course yeah. I deal with that. Richard, your next choice is Flashman, George MacDonald Fraser. Yeah. Uh, it was recommended to you by your co-presenter on The Big Breakfast, Johnny Vaughan. That's right, yes. These are Johnny Vaughan's favourite series of books and uh, have now become my favourite series of books. There are either 12 or 13 in the series, and the last one came out in 2005, but they started coming out, I think, in the late 60s. The first one is about the first Afghan war, and I read it in about, I think, about 2000. And it was just before the invasion of Afghanistan and that war started that he's still going on. And I did feel as I knew Afghanistan. And I remember sure. thinking at the time, you know, good luck with that. It's, it's a country that's impossible to run, manage, govern centrally. It's tribal and it's difficult. Yeah. And the British knew that in the first Afghan war, but it seems to have uh, largely forgotten it's it now. It's a shame they didn't uh, all read uh, <laughs> well, well, Flashman. Flashman, well, of course, uh, is taken from Tom Brown's school days. Which is not an interesting idea. So... Yeah. Thomas Hughes wrote Tom Brown's School Days and Flashman is the bully at rugby under the headmaster Arnold. And George MacDonald Fraser has taken a fictional character written by someone else and imagined a life for him. What is extraordinary is I can't say one actually likes him, but one is very happy to read about him book after book, and yet he's a coward. He's not so much a bully now, but he will bully if he can. And he's an adventurer and he's not particularly honest. And he's no. not, but uh, he's a reprehensible character. He is. It doesn't matter, does it? At the end of this book, he meets Queen Victoria. He gets a Victoria cross. He calls her quite attractive from the neck down. It's, it's so... They're so good, and I have learnt an awful lot about big moments in history that I knew nothing about 
that we ought to all remember. Is he a hero to you, Flashwood? In, in some ways, he is a hero. He's another monster. I like these books with monsters in. You're I don't... drawn to outrageous people. I'm drawn to outrageous people. I think that's absolutely true. Phyllis, your next choice is a thriller, which isn't surprising, but it isn't one that's incredibly well-known. It's called Tragedy at Law by Cyril Hare. Mm. Tell us about this, cos it's very important in your life, isn't this it? This is very important. There are a, a series of books uh, by Cyril Hare, and he was, in real life, he was a High Court judge, and all his books, in fact, the, the solution of, of the, uh, the puzzle rests on a point of law. Um, very, very elegantly written, beautifully written. And what happened, I'd finished reading it, and I'd sent my manuscript off uh, to an agent, and she was called Elaine Green, and she was married at the time to Hugh Carlton Green, who was Director General of the BBC. Mm -hmm. And she read the manuscript, and that evening, she and the Director General were due to go to Oxford to have dinner at All Souls. And at that dinner, they sat next to Charles Monteith, who was a director of Faber and Faber. And Charles said, of how sad it was that Cyril Hare, Judge Clark, had died in early middle age, and that Fabus did like to have a detective writer on their list, so they would be looking for one. And Elaine said, I found it, I found her. Oh. And sent off the manuscript next day, and Faber and Faber took it. So I was extraordinarily fortunate. I was accepted with my first book by the first publisher it was sent to. So I, I have an affection for it anyway, and I do reread it with great pleasure. And it does teach me well, what I learned very early, of course, and knew almost by instinct, that it's possible to write an, an exciting book, it's possible to stay within the constraints and the so-called formula of the classical detective story and still write well and still yeah. have an elegant and good style and respect for our magnificent and wonderful language and still say something true about men and women and the society in which we live, which Cyril Hare does. And your next book, Richard, you, you learnt a lot about Afghanistan from Flashman. Yeah. And this is uh, a work of non-fiction. It's called Stasi Land by Anna Funda. Tell us about this. Well, this uh, is a book uh, about life behind the wall. Anna Funda is Australian and she was working, I think, at a television station in West Berlin and became fascinated by what happens behind the wall. And what I like about it is it's not a historian giving you his view of life in East Berlin and East Germany at that time. Uh, she does it as a journalist and she meets lots of people who either lived under the Stasi, the Stasi were the East German secret mm. police, uh, or, and she goes and meets former members of the Stasi, and they tell their stories. There's very little of her view in it. Phyllis, have you been to Berlin many times? Yes, I have. Um, sometimes with the, with the British Council, which I was a member, and uh, sometimes to promote my own books. And yeah. I've been there when the wall was up, when the wall was coming down and after the wall was down. Um, and uh, certainly when the wall was up, it was the most exciting city I think I've ever visited. The West? The West. Yeah. yeah. Did you visit East Berlin? Yes, I did. I went into East... I went to that magnificent... They, they've got wonderful museums. What, do, what does your generation think about World War II? Are you as aware of it as, say, Phyllis, who was mm. grown up, and myself, who was born just after? I am. I'm 35. I think my generation is. Uh, people who are perhaps 20 and in their teens, I yeah. wonder if we're now at the point where it will be as distant as Waterloo. It will mm. just be this thing from history. Mm. And what's clever about Stasiland is it reminds you it's not simply a historical event, uh, a lot of these psychological scars are still very real for people, and I think the book helps you realise that. We've heard about your childhood reads and the books that have influenced you. We move on now to books you've simply enjoyed, The Beach Read <laughs> or A Guilty Pleasure. For you, Phyllis, uh, your guilty pleasure, if you want to call it that, is The Pursuit of Love by Nancy Mitford. Yes, indeed. All Nancy Metford's books. I just love them. And they're the sort of book you keep by your bed in case you wake up in the night and have bad dreams and just want a bit of comfort. Can you tell us about the book? Well, they're strongly autobiographical. She came, of course, from a remarkable family, mostly of girls. There was only one son. And all these girls were remarkable. I mean, one of them was a great friend of Hitler's, and the mm. other one was the Duchess of Devonshire, and the other one was the very beautiful one, Diana, who married Mosley and was imprisoned during the war. Um, and they were an astonishing family. It's that kind of 
book but you're constantly if not laughing constantly smiling mm. we've we've got uh, a clip from the bbc sound archives we found of nancy mitford talking yeah. about her own skills as a writer yeah did you ever go to university i not only never went to a university but i was never taught lessons i was taught to read and write i can't spell either in french or in english at all i was taught no arithmetic at all i can't do some, uh, any some, however simple. And when I have to fill in forms here, which inv involve very small additions or multiplications, I have to send for my charwoman's grandson. <laughs> <laughs> so there's proof you, you don't need to be able to spell to become a great writer. No. Your final book and your guilty pleasure, Richard, is an up-to-date piece of fiction, One Day by David Nichols. Tell us about it. It's, it's the story of Dexter and Emma. It starts in, I think, 1988 at Edinburgh University. It's their graduation day. And we catch up with them on one day every year for just over 20 years. There's a lot that I, re I recognise in it. Uh, he, Dexter, uh, put, first of all, he lives in Belsize Park, which is where I live. They spend a lot of time in Edinburgh, which I go to a lot. He's also a TV presenter who's presented lots of rubbish television programmes. Uh, and that was something that I immediately recognised, Anne. Uh, and has had a number of hedonistic... Uh, a number of hedonistic experiences as well. Um, and, uh, but then it, everyone I know who's read it finds something of themselves in it. Mm. And I think that's one of the very clever things about it. Mm. It's constantly funny, uh, and it's a sad book as well, but I, I've never spent so long thinking about two people who don't actually exist. Now, this is difficult, but I'm going to ask you, Phyllis, if you had to choose just one book to recommend from your five, which would it be? Well, I think it, it has to be the Austin, because if people not... I mean, it is a, a, well, appeal more to women than to men, but I think that once you really get to know Austin, then, then you are reading one of the greatest of our novelists. And um, I love her. And uh, she has been the strongest, I think, influence in my writing. So it would have to be. I think it would have to be. Richard? Uh, mine would definitely be Flashman. Because it, it basically straddles fiction and non-fiction. It's a fictional story through which you learn a lot about history. Uh, and it's also brilliant and he's very funny. What do you think, Richard, your overall choices say about you? Uh, I think, to some extent, they, in relation to Fashman and Stick It Up Your Punter, they say that I'm quite intrigued and drawn towards monstrous characters. Um, I think I have an interest in, in, in history. I like history. And uh, that, I think, even Stick It Up Your Punter, it's in some ways a historical document, so I think that's reflected in there. Um, what one day says about me, I've no idea. That really isn't the sort of book Maybe I'm... you're just a bit soppy. Yes, I think <laughs> I'm getting older and becoming terribly soppy. Phyllis, what do your choices say about you? Probably I'm a woman who likes order, who likes disorder being made into order, order brought out of disorder, which is what the detective story does. Um, more cautious than you, being a woman, possibly. Um, liking things to work out happily in the end and loving the English language. I think we have the richest, the most versatile, and I think the most beautiful language in the world. Well, there we are. Thank you to P.D. James and Richard Bacon for joining me Thank for you. my life in book. <laughs>9th of February across the BBC. Two more places are up for grabs in the final. Ooh. Who'll get the hundred on their feet? I take my hat off to you. There's a lot more there than I thought there was going to be. <laughs> what do you do for a living?
This is where the magic happens. From small Swedish town to global leader. I've always seen IKEA as more of a movement than a company. Love it or loathe it. BBC Two gets exclusive access into IKEA's £34 billion operation. That's really crazy. Flatpak Empire starts Tuesday at 9 on BBC Two. Food, truth or scare in 45 minutes. First on BBC Two, the show that turns your world upside down. 